right. Well, hopefully we are live here and ready to roll. Um, I wanted to go over a trio here of priests that Joseph Smith really focuses on here. And I think that a lot of the fountain of this comes out, excuse me, out of the book of Hebrews. And so we have Melchizedek and Abraham, and we have Jesus Christ. And if we look at three different places, really four, but let's, let's focus on three here. We have Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. We have the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 14. This is where Melchizedek and Abraham meet after Abraham is gone after uh, Lot. He's gone to go and get Lot and go to war with the Canaanite kings to go get Lot back. And then he meets with Melchizedek and he pays tithing to this Melchizedek figure. We don't hear a lot about Melchizedek uh, throughout the scriptures. And there's a reason for that, I think. I think that you, if you go through and you, you see there, there seems to be somewhat of a suppression on this of a Melchizedek tradition. And so it, 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 it's not very apparent who this Melchizedek is or probably more importantly, what he represents. However, with Joseph Smith, he's gone in and, and really in one of the places of the Bible where he has put in one of his uh, most beefy sections of his translation, it's in Genesis 14. And it's not a coincidence, right? Because he's going to go in and he's going to focus in on Melchizedek and Abraham and talk about uh, this Melchizedek order and this Melchizedek priesthood that both Melchizedek and then eventually Abraham have, and what is required of it and what it represents. The other place we look at is in the Book of Mormon in Alma 13, where we get a good description of the order of the Son of God, the order of Melchizedek. And that's an important thing to understand, the title of the priesthood and what the Melchizedek figure represents. We get a much greater understanding of the book of Hebrews if we understand the titling here and look at these things as titles and not just descriptions. For example, the order of the Son of God, right? The priesthood after the order of the Son of God is a title. This is a title that, for example, when John wrote his gospel, which was written after the other synoptic gospels of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he had already had his vision of the book of Revelation, which is at the end of the New Testament. And he much later writes the gospel, and he gives his reason for writing it at the very end. And he says it's so, because of his testimony and to testify of the Son of God. That is not just saying about Jesus Christ. In my opinion, looking at that, it is a title that he's talking about, the same title that is used over and over again, especially right up front in the book of Hebrews, where we see the Son of God and the only begotten Son. This represents something. Alma does the same thing, where we have this order of, of the Son of God, and he, and he talks about that. We also have it in Genesis 14, verses 29 and 32. 32 after the order of the Son of God. Again in Mosiah, I believe it's 13 or 14, Abinadi gives us a description of really titles of why Jesus Christ is the Father and also how he is the Son. So these are titles given to Jesus Christ. And he says that Jesus Christ is the Son because of his condescension, because he came down to earth, was born of a woman, and took on the sins of the world, right, and lived a mortal life. That's what the Melchizedek priesthood is really all about. It is about heaven coming down to earth and reaching down. And so it would be the condescension of Jesus Christ, the condescension of God. And that's what the Melchizedek priesthood represents. It's all things that are spiritual. We learn that in sections 84 and 107. And so the focus of this trio here of Melchizedek and Abraham 
and Jesus Christ are brought together in these three basic areas of of the book of Hebrews, Joseph, or, uh, Joseph Smith translation, Genesis 14, and Alma 13. And the principle that brings them together is that of faith. And Hebrews makes it very clear, as does the other two uh, uh, references, that faith, when they talk about faith, they are specifically talking about faith in the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's what brings everything together. So if we were looking at Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, starting right off with faith, and Alma 13.4, and uh, Genesis 14, verses 29 and 32, we see that it is faith in Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice that is what the Melchizedek priesthood is all about. And we've gone through all the epistles in the New Testament. We see the difference between what faith represents which is in the, the grace of God, and what works represent down here, which is in the law or working toward justice. That's what we bring to the table, is our works. We can't make ourselves work ourselves way back to God, and we're always in debt to Him. And so it's grace that ultimately saves us and gives us the opportunity to return to God. But the Melchizedek priesthood, is about that grace and about the faith in that atoning sacrifice. The Son of God is really, you think about, you know, a, another place we can look at for a tradition of Melchizedek is the Essenes. And the Essenes were a Jewish sect that lived in the wilderness in, in Palestine, probably down in Egypt. And they have a Melchizedek scroll. And in this Melchizedek scroll, it shows that they are waiting for the new Melchizedek. Right now, why would they be waiting for a Melchizedek or a new Melchizedek? The reason is, is because there is a tradition that is not found in the Bible, unless you really look closely for it, of a son of God that would be born into the world and that it, that it would be God, and that he would be born into the world, and that he would come as a Messiah, and that he would fulfill the role of Melchizedek. And this is not obviously the same person that Abraham met with, but the title of Melchizedek is the same title or goes hand in hand with the title of the Son of God. These are titles that, think about a coronation where someone is given, you know, even in, you know, the king or queen of England and the prince and the princess, they're, they're given several titles when they go in and are coronated. This is the exact same thing about the king of Salem, which is Melchizedek. Melchizedek means in Hebrew, it's king of righteousness, Malki Sedek. And it also then would be something similar to a description or a title that we get of Jesus Christ, which is Prince of Peace. Salem is peace, or Shalom, Salem is peace. And so we get these titles around something that would be familiar with a figure of royalty or someone being crowned. And all of these titles come together then in what would be similar to a temple drama or a coronation, which would go hand in hand. It used to be, anciently, that in the temple, there used to be a temple drama. We don't know much about this. What we do know is that the Psalms are temple scriptures. They come from the temple. They're founded in the temple. They're kind of garbled up. They appear to be completely uh, out of order, of the way that they should be, but we can look through there and we can see several things that give us an idea of what a temple drama would have been, including a coronation of the Davidic king that would go in to the temple, pass through, and go into the Holy of Holies and sit on the throne of God as a king. And this would make him the son of of God as well. He also went in in a role acting as the Son of God and acting as Jehovah. 
And we see the great thing about the book of Hebrews in the New Testament is that we get this focus on this royal figure and this high priestly figure of Melchizedek and a high priest, a great high priest that we don't get as much in the rest of the scriptures. And so we see that if we were looking back at the crucifixion and we see above the cross, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This is not just a mocking of him, but this is saying what he and his followers were claiming, that he was the Son of God, this tradition that had been squelched, that that's who he is. He is this king that had been given a role in the temple drama, probably during the Feast of Tabernacles, along with the Day of Atonement, where we get a lot of that imagery in the book of Hebrews. And given that role, this is who he came and fulfilled this prophecy and fulfilled this role. Now, Abraham is a big part of this as well. Uh, not only did he meet with Melchizedek, but as we read throughout these three areas here, we, we get this theme on Abraham and his faith, and him waiting patiently, having faith, he and Sarah, having faith in Jesus Christ, and that they are going to have Isaac eventually, even though they're well beyond their years. And so this is an expression that is used perhaps even along with this temple drama. Again, if we look at these areas of Scripture, a lot of Scripture, more than we might at first notice, a lot of Scripture is ritual. And so we think, how is it? why is it written like this? It seems strange. It's not just the translation, and it's not just because it's from a different culture, but a lot of it is something that we don't understand because we don't know the rituals so well. But a lot of what we have there is based on ritual, especially based on temple imagery. You see that throughout Hebrews. If you saw any of my uh, uh, episodes on the book of Hebrews, you'll see how it talks all about passing through the temple of Solomon, going through and eventually ending up being coronated and sitting on the throne in the Holy of Holies. And so Abraham is a, is a big example of this that's tied closely in with that. Another one is the Exodus and being able to enter into the rest of God, which is the seventh day of creation, which goes right along with the temple. And it's also the promised land that the children of Israel would eventually arrive in, although those that were at Mount Sinai did not were not able to get in. So Joseph Smith, I, I, you can kind of see in his mind here, as he is going through this, the, the revelation that would be coming down to him as he's going through the book of Hebrews, having already translated the Book of Mormon and had Alma 13 in there, and, and then going back perhaps and looking at Genesis. I don't know what the order of that was, what, which one he came through first, but uh, it's you can just see the lights turning on with him about this Melchizedek priesthood. This is not something that, you know, in the church where we have a Melchizedek and an Aaronic priesthood, it's, it's crucial that they are separate. They are different. They represent different things. The Aaronic priesthood is a carnal priesthood, and it represents temporal things. It represents the law. It represents our works reaching up toward God. And the Melchizedek priesthood represents Again, the things that are spiritual, that are coming down from God, the Holy Ghost, the sacrifice of Christ, etc. And so it would have been a lot easier, for example, if with Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, that, you know, hey, P Peter, James, and John could have came and just given them the fullness of, uh, of the Melchizedek priesthood. But of course, it didn't happen that way. John the Baptist had to come and give them the Aaronic priesthood first. They are separate, and it's the exact same thing with the sacrament that we have. There's a reason why it is separate, why there are two different prayers, because the bread represents the Aaronic or the lower law, the flesh, the temporal, 
which needs to be quickened with the Spirit, and the water or wine would represent the things of God, the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood that he shed. And so they've got to be separate. And so with Joseph Smith, you can just see these, the, his mind turning and this revelation, this light and spirit coming down to him as he's going through the book of Hebrews and seeing how the, the coronation and the high priestly office is represented in this book. And if you have a, um, a look at, uh, well, again, imagine a king at the Feast of Tabernacles, and he is out in front of everybody. And what is the Feast of Tabernacles? It's the tents, right? It's Sukkot, they call it. And so you would have all the tents that would be out inside the temple court, perhaps, or just outside, and they're participating in this temple drama. And they have the king, the Davidic king, David, Solomon, others, that are going through a temple drama along with the queen and along with other characters. And they are going through ritual. And here you have a son of God that is the great high priest represented through the Davidic king. You can think of even facsimile number three, right, where the god Osiris is sitting on the throne, and Joseph Smith says that is Abraham. It's a temple drama. It's a role. It is their actors filling these roles. And Jesus Christ is the role of the Son of God that Melchizedek would have played and Abraham would have played as well, and the Davidic kings would have played. And so this priestly trio of Melchizedek and Abraham and Jesus Christ are brought together so well in Hebrews, we understand from this that Jesus Christ is not just the Redeemer. And that is obviously the focus, is his sacrifice. That is his mission. But he also was a restorer of a, of the, uh, and, and receiver of well, a dispenser of the fullness of the gospel and of the priesthood keys in his time, right? He was a great high priest. He was a Melchizedek priest, restoring all of the gospel to the, to the earth, which they did not have. They only had, for the most part, the Aaronic priesthood for a very long time, for centuries and centuries. And so, Joseph Smith, if you go through these places, I, I highly recommend that you go back and look at Joseph Smith translation, Genesis 14. I think there's 15 or 16 completely Joseph Smith script, uh, verses in there that go over this. And then look at Alma 13, and then come back and look at at least looking at, uh, at, at uh, Hebrews 11 through 13. And imagine the temple drama that is playing out. Imagine the temple imagery that is happening here and the representation of a Melchizedek priesthood separate from an Aaronic priesthood. And imagine why Jesus coming through in what they called a triumphant entry, which really wasn't triumphant. He hadn't conquered anything. It's a royal procession right? It's part of the drama. That's the way I see it anyway. He comes through on the donkey, comes into the gates of Jerusalem from the outside, and where does he end up? He ends up at the temple. Of course he does. And what does he do there? Just like the, the high priest on the Day of Atonement, he cleanses the temple. And so Hebrews is kind of the crux that we have of this theology. There's so much LDS doctrine found in that book. Um, highly recommend that you take a very close look at it and review it often. I appreciate your time. Thank you.